thank you all for being here. We appreciate that. We do have votes coming as early as 30 minutes from now. So I think there are some of us here who are going to want to ask questions. We'll have one round of questions, and mine will be very brief. And uh, then we'll go into a classified session and see how much we can cover before votes are actually uh, impending and we have to leave. So we appreciate your attendance here. I have an opening statement, but I'm going to submit it for the record for the sake of time. And I'll now call on the ranking member to see what he would like to do. And I'm going to take the, the wise counsel of following the chairman's <laughs> leadership and also submitting my statement for the record. We'd like to expedite things so that we can get to votes and then get to the classified session. Thank you. OK, then let's go right into our uh, distinguished witnesses. We have the Honorable John Plum, General Anthony Cotton, General Stephen Whiting, and General Gregory uh, Gilot, if I said that correctly. Gio. 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 Okay, I, I was way off. I'm, I'll get that before. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, Gilo. Uh, Mr. Plum, can you start, please? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman Lamborn, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member Moulton. Uh, Members of the committee, uh, thanks for inviting me to testify here. I'll keep my remarks short in the interest of moving to uh, questions. Uh, but just very briefly, we're in a very highly dynamic and challenging security environment. Uh, we have competitors who are modernizing and diversifying and expanding their nuclear arsenals. They are also rapidly fielding space and counter space capabilities and developing and fielding advanced missiles in more, uh, you know, greater numbers and uh, greater diversity. The President's budget request for fiscal year 25 makes critical investments in the Department's strategic forces posture, $49 billion for our nuclear enterprise, uh, $33.7 billion for our space capabilities, and over $28 billion for missile defeat and defense. And across each of these portfolios, we're investing not only in capabilities, but in our network of allies and partners, both of whom provide advantages that our adversaries or potential adversaries like Russia and China can never hope to match. All of these capabilities, nuclear, space, and missile defense, remain central to our ability to, to deter uh, and also central to our ability to prevail in conflict if deterrence fails. The Department is committed to making the critical investments necessary to strengthen our strategic forces posture. Thanks to this committee for its tireless dedication to the Department, to our men and women in uniform, and I look forward to answering your questions. General Cotton. Good afternoon, Chairman Lamborn, Ranking Member Moulton, and distinguished members of this committee. It is an honor to be here today with my command senior enlisted, advisor, senior enlisted leader, Sergeant Major Kramer, and our privilege to represent the service members and civilians of the United States Strategic Command. I have submitted my posh statement for the record. As a global warfighting command, STRATCOM sets conditions across the globe as the ultimate guarantor of the national and allied security, <coughs> excuse me, we do this in the face of challenges unlike anything America has encountered. We are confronting not one, but two nuclear peers, the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China. This reality compounded by missile developments in North Korea, Iran's nuclear ambitions, and the growing relationships between these nations adds new layers of complexity to our strategic calculus. While our legacy systems continue to hold potential adversaries at risk, it is absolutely critical we continue at speed with modernization of our nuclear triad. This includes the land-based ICBMs, the B-21, the B-52J, the Columbia-class submarine, the nuclear sea-launched cruise missile, the long-range standoff weapon, and numerous related systems, while also focusing on NC3 enterprise upgrades and cybersecurity. The most important message I want to deliver is this. While modernization will continue to be the priority, U.S. STRATCOM and its component forces are ready to deter our adversaries and respond decisively should deterrence fail. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Whiting. Chairman Lamborn and Ranking Member Moulton, members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify. I'm pleased to be here beside Dr. Plum, General Cotton, and General Gill, and I will also abbreviate my opening statement. Our strategic competitors now hold at risk U.S. and allied space capabilities. The People's Republic of China and Russia's actions have transformed space 
into a contested warfighting domain. U.S. Space Command's moral responsibility to the Joint Force, the nation, and our allies is to provide space capabilities through all levels of competition and conflict. The U.S. military services are sized with the assumption of always having access to space. And this is why U.S. Space Command must protect and defend our critical space systems to ensure they are available in the face of the growing threats now arrayed against us. Inherent in this responsibility is our ability to protect the Joint Force from space-enabled attack. The command seeks to expand our competitive advantage by leveraging every available asset of the interagency, Joint Force, our allies, partners, and industry. Yet it is vital the command is delivered improved capability and capacity by 2027 to attain an enduring advantage over any determined adversary. I am grateful for Congress's commitment to advance America's leadership in space. With your continued backing, U.S. Space Command will ensure space remains sustainable, safe, stable, and secure for all. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. And General Guillo. Chairman Lamborn, Ranking Member Moulton, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it's a profound honor to command and represent the women and men of North American Aerospace Defense Command and United States Northern Command. I'm also pleased to appear alongside General Cotton, General Whiting, and Dr. Plum. NORAD and NORTHCOM depend on robust space-based capabilities to execute each of our critical missions, and the strategic deterrent remains the foundation of our homeland defense. The strong partnerships I enjoy with my fellow witnesses are crucial. The United States and Canada face an extraordinarily complex strategic environment. Our competitors have fielded advanced kinetic systems designed to strike civilian and military infrastructure in North America, both above and below the nuclear threshold. As stated in the National Defense Strategy, the People's Republic of China remains our pacing challenge as the People's Liberation Army modernizes and grows at a rapid pace. The PRC's expanding nuclear capability and capacity, along with its development of modern submarines, missiles, hypersonic weapons, all present significant challenges for homeland defense. While the PRC's capabilities are growing quickly, Russia is a threat to the homeland today and is an immediate concern. Russia retains the world's largest stockpile of strategic and non-strategic nuclear weapons and has the capacity to strike inside North America with air and sea-launched precision conventional weapons. Despite heavy losses to its ground forces in Ukraine, Russia has invested heavily in systems that can threaten the United States, such as advanced guided missile submarines, hypersonic glide vehicles, and ICBMs. Russia also maintains significant cyber and undersea capabilities and developmental systems such as a nuclear torpedo and a nuclear-powered cruise missile. Meanwhile, North Korea continues its rhetoric while testing, test launching increasingly advanced long-range missiles and expanding its ties with Russia and China. While Iran currently lacks the capability to strike North America with long-range missiles, it is investing in that capability. Iran also supports violent militant groups in the Middle East and maintains a worldwide network of operational surrogates. With those risks firmly in mind, NORAD and NORTHCOM strive to begin homeland defense well beyond North America. To do so, both commands are working with the services and Congress to improve domain awareness in order to detect, track, and defeat threats ranging from long-range ballistic missiles to small UASs. Finally, upon taking command, I began a 90-day assessment to inform the Department, the Joint Force, and Congress on NORAD and NORTHCOM's ability to execute assigned tasks and make recommendations on where the command can and should do more. Once complete, I will share my findings and updated vision for how NORAD and NORTHCOM will best execute the noble mission of homeland defense. The challenges facing our nation are real, but there should be no doubt about NORAD and NORTHCOM's resolve to deter aggression and, if necessary, defeat threats to our nation and our citizens. Again, thank you for the opportunity to appear this afternoon, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, um, all of you, for your opening statements. I'll reiterate what I said earlier. There will be votes called as early as 4 o'clock. Uh, I have some questions I will submit for the record. I'm going to ask one very brief question of Dr. Plum and then turn it over to my ranking member. And then everyone has a chance to ask questions. And then if we have time, we'll go into a classified session upstairs. But in no event will we come back and have any continuation of this hearing after votes are called. Uh, it'll be fairly lengthy vote series, and I don't want to keep everybody. And so we will adjourn whenever votes are called. 
with about a 10 minute gap uh, grace period for us to finish, wrap up what we're doing and get over for the votes. Uh, Dr. Plum, very quickly, in its 2022 nuclear posture review, the administration affirmed the continued, the continued need for the triad. Has there been any changes in the administration's policy in this regard? No, there has not. Thank you. Ranking Member Moulton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I'll also just ask uh, one question. I'm going to direct it to Dr. Plum and General Cotton, if either of you have comments on this. What thinking has the department done or been doing on what strategic deterrence looks like with two nuclear peers? What does the world mean? What does that world mean for our nuclear posture, our strategy, and our strategy of deterrence? If it's all right, uh, sir, I'll start and then I'll hand it to General Cotton. So, uh, taking it very seriously, I know you and I have talked about this. Uh, the Strategic Posture Commission, hopefully, uh, you know, bipartisan report that's come out really looking at this specific problem, and the department is using that as a bit of a uh, as a as a reference guide to help us examine how to go forward. Uh, the fundamental issue here, as you've pointed out, is uh, China's growth in their nuclear arsenal, and it's a intercontinental level nuclear arsenal uh, changes the calculus. We don't want to be in a situation where we have to have as many nuclear weapons as Russia plus as many as China plus one more, but we do have to be able to deter both. Uh, and so we are looking at that. I'd say uh, roughly we think, uh, you know, we continue to be sufficient now. The program of record is okay now, but in the future we're going to have to make adjustments uh, because of this growth of China. And so we're looking at what things can we credibly do uh, to help ensure the deterrence will continue to hold uh, through the 2030s, both through our transition and in face of China's growing uh, threat. General Cotton. Thank you. Ranking Member Moulton, um, I'd like to add that we've been looking um, from Strategic Command uh, ever since I took command last uh, 15 months ago. And, and, and what we're looking at is the strategic piece that is linked to the NPR because the NPR allows us to look at posture and sizing. So we immediately looked at that. But as I, you know, as I mentioned to you in the office call, I think it's really about strategy as well. Um, so we have actually uh, commissioned a study within STRATCOM uh, with a, a, another group of bipartisan uh, representation to really look at it from a strategic level when you have two near peers in which you have to, to, to fight. Um, <clears throat> and how do you hold them at risk um, in, in order to do that? Um, and as well, as you know, uh, the, the triad itself, um, all legs of it from delivery systems to the weapons themselves are all being modernized. So just as important is what does that transition from legacy system um, look like to modernized systems moving forward? Uh, and we have a study that's uh, well underway to, to make sure that we don't create any gaps in that transition moving forward. Well, I think that's very encouraging because the world has certainly changed. Mr. Chairman? Thank you. Representative Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you for being here today and your service on behalf of the people of the United States. Uh, General Cotton, in your testimony, you state that the critical need to modernize our stockpile infrastructure and a robust science and technology base for our strategic deterrence force. I'm grateful to represent the Savannah River site where they are working around the clock to bring plutonium production facility into operation as soon as possible. They are also working to replace a 1950s era's building at the Savannah River Tritium Enterprise. As the only member of Congress who's ever worked at the Savannah River site, I know personally of how dedicated the personnel are for the people of America. With this, would delaying the modernization put our security at risk? And uh, we are really grateful that plutonium pit production, which is so crucial, is actually a two-site solu two solution with Los Alamos and Savannah River. So what is the status of uh, maintaining our capabilities? Representative, thank you so much. Um, and I've had the opportunity of actually visiting uh, Savannah River twice um, in, in, um, <coughs> in my uh, recent job and, and in my former job. Um, you're absolutely right. The men and women that are, are, are there are in, incredible Americans and, and dedicated patriots. Um, to your point, I think when we think about the, the products and components that are going to be required from NNSA, um, I, I, I want to keep the throttle, throttle pressed 
um, and ensuring that we get uh, pit productions in the numbers we want. I also think that we also need to pay attention to the other rare, rare earth materials that are, are warranted and, and, and needed, not only tritium, but also lithium and, and other components that, that might be uh, something that's, uh, that, that, can, that can, can hold them back, if you will, as far as NS, NNSA in their production. And then finally, um, I think uh, industrial base and, and, and making sure that the, the brick and mortar, as you know, that, you know the, the things that are actually being produced and built there, the facility itself across uh, the enterprise uh, for NNSA to ensure that they can accomplish all of that to get the, the buildings built in order to get the production done. Over. <clears throat> and General, thank you so much. You're always welcome back to Savannah Riverside anytime. And please let me know when you're there because I'd like to be with you. Uh, thank you for your service. And Secretary Plum, you stated in your testimony that Iran continues to expand their nuclear activities. Additionally, you also state that at this time, quote, we believe Iran is not currently pursuing nuclear weapons. Secretary Plum, I, I, I just, uh, that's amazing to me because um, the regime in Tehran is pursuing uh, an effort of uh, increasing their stockpile of highly enriched uranium. The regime in Tehran is continuing to develop ICBMs, uh, which uh, can only be used uh, with the intent of striking the United States. Uh, and they make it clear uh, as they chant, uh, death to Israel, death to America. And so uh, it's just um, really appalling to me uh, that we're in a war we didn't choose, and that is uh, a war uh, with dictators with rule of gun invading democracies with rule of law. And we know that and it began February 22, 2022, uh, with war criminal Putin invading Ukraine. And then October 7th, the puppet Hamas of Iran invaded Israel with mass murder. Uh, the dots are so easy to connect between the axis of evil. And Iran is, uh, we know, providing drones and missiles to Putin to murder Ukrainians. In return, uh, their collaboration, I, I just can't imagine, would not include nuclear and missile development. A nuclear bomb would destabilize the Middle East with a vaporization of Israel as Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and our Persian Gulf allies are threatened. How close is the regime in Tehran to a nuclear weapon? Uh, uh, thank you, sir. I don't have a specific um, time frame for your exact question, but I'll just say uh, my testimony is based on intelligence uh, assessment, which is you can enrich uranium without pursuing a nuclear weapon. Obviously, you need enriched uranium to build a nuclear weapon, so I take your point. As far as how close it is, I don't, perhaps General Cotton has a, has a kind of an intel well, informed hey, assessment. I, my, I don't have it on top of my head. My time is up, but hey, we're dealing with Iran. They have uh, in, enough energy capability, uh, oil and gas. Uh, they don't need to have uh, a enriched u uranium. Uh, there's only one purpose for, the, uh, for them to have enriched uranium, and that's to develop a nuclear weapon to attack the United States. I yield back. Representative Carbajal is next on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we all know space is essential to our everyday lives, and I don't think most people understand this. Not only is space critical to our national security programs, but we rely on space to check our weather, our phones, to use a credit card, and now in some cases for internet connection, just to name a few. These capabilities are primarily because of our nation's robust commercial space industry. General Whiting, can you speak to the partnership between Space Command and commercial space companies? How do commercial space companies help you fulfill your mission? Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, I think one of our nation's uh, principal advantages is our commercial space industry. Uh, it is moving at incredible speed with innovation, and it is outpacing commercial industry from the rest of the world. And so today we partner with uh, those companies in a number of ways. One way is through information sharing, a, a cell called the Commercial Integration Cell at Vandenberg uh, Space Force Base in California. And then we also uh, leverage services provided by uh, commercial companies. And so we're always looking at how we can better uh, both share information and leverage the capabilities that commercial brings us because we believe that makes us more effective. Thank you. For those watching, um, Vandenberg is in my district. General Whiting, what do you think uh, the biggest challenge is in space domain? 
and how can Congress help you overcome uh, this challenge? Thank you, Congressman. Um, our biggest challenge today is the speed at which the People's Republic of China continues to develop its space capabilities. And in particular, they are developing a number of uh, counterspace uh, weapon systems to hold at risk our space systems. They're also using space to enable their terrestrial forces, their Army, their Navy, their Air Force, Marines, to make them more lethal, more precise, and more far-ranging. So uh, I would ask the Congress's support to continue to invest, uh, particularly in the United States Space Force, but also in the other services that provide us capability at U.S. Space Command, because they have to now take our current constellations and make them more resilient. They have to develop systems that we can protect and defend uh, those constellations. Um, we need capabilities to protect the joint force from the space enabling capabilities of others. And then we need a testing and training uh, uh, environment that allows us to know with confidence that our space systems will work the way we need them to. And, uh, and that's, all a lot of, uh, that's a lot of new work, and we need to make sure that we're able to do that. Thank you. A space commands and the Space Force's ability to move quickly has been impressive. <laughs> Dr. Plum, can you elaborate on why a mission like Victus Knox is important, and why do you think we've seen success when moving quickly when it comes to space, whether it's uh, it be technically uh, responsive space or uh, space development agency proliferation satellite architecture? Uh, thank you, Congressman, uh, for the questions here. On Victus Knox, which is a tactically responsive launch, I'm a big fan of this concept of being able to launch quickly, uh, in particular in the way it was done there, which is in response to, uh, you know, a simulated threat. So I think the idea of how, what you use tactically responsive launch for, uh, the original thought was maybe use it for reconstitution, uh, which may have a play here, but I really do think the idea of there's something new, we want to go look at it, how fast can we stack a rocket, get a payload on there to go inspect a thing, or uh, uh, is a really interesting question, and I, I think the services really knocked it out of the park on that particular, on that particular mission. Uh, your second question uh, was about moving faster, I think, in Space Development Agency, uh, and as General Whiting just said, you know, partnering with commercial uh, space, which is currently an economic engine for the United States, which we should all be proud of. Uh, one of the things the business community needs to do is actually innovate at speed so they can close their business case, and we're trying to figure out how to harness that. And I think what Derek Turnier is doing at SDA is really impressive, which is trying to get the government to move faster and trying to build on best of current available and do replenishment with uh, increasing uh, technological upgrade as we go. It's a really impressive uh, thing he's doing, and I think we need to continue to encourage it. And as I've said in this committee before, that also means we would need uh, congressional help to make sure that if something fails or not every single satellite works, that we don't shut down that effort. That's actually built into the way we want to design going forward. Thank you. I won't have time for your response, but I want to put this question in the record. Responsible behavior in space is critical to the productive use of this domain now and for future generations. Dr. Plum, how does the department encourage responsible behavior or detour dangerous behavior in this domain? You don't have to answer it. I'm out of time. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Just send me the answer. Thank you, yes, Representative sir. Stefanik. Thank you so much, Chairman. General Guillot, as ballistic missile threats from North Korea and Iran continue to advance, do you believe that it would be strategically worthwhile to construct a third homeland missile defense site at the DOD and Congress's chosen East Coast location at Fort Drum, New York? Congresswoman, I'm aware that uh, there was a recent uh, assessment that said that uh, such a site was not an operational necessity. However, as an operational commander that watches very closely the advances that our uh, adversaries are making, uh, primarily Iran and uh, even more so North Korea, uh, I think that it's uh, important for me as the commander to have uh, continually assessed the threat and see if there are any changes in the threat environment that would necessitate uh, additional capabilities to, defect the, to affect the homeland. And so I would, sorry. General, in, the, in my office, when you were kind enough to visit, you said it would be strategically worthwhile and you supported the construction. I understand the assessment process, but um, as, as you and I spoke in my office, you said this would be strate strategically worthwhile, particularly as we're considering threats not, threats not just of today, but of the future as well. Uh, yes, Congressman. If if the assessment came back that those threats, I thought it would be worthwhile to um, uh, to, to build that site, uh, a site. 
what would an operational requirement for a third Homeland Missile Defense Site look like? Uh, Congresswoman, that would depend on the threat, but I think uh, dispersal away from the, the sites that we have now so we don't have all of our proverbial eggs in, in, in one basket would be very important. And the other would be to make sure that it is located uh, somewhere in the continental United States where it would um, have the kinematic responsiveness to uh, intercept threats that are coming from a different avenue. And Fort Drum meets those requirements. Well, I would... Uh, that's the DOD's position. That's Congress's okay. position, that Fort Drum is, in fact, the location of a potential East Coast missile defense site. You are aware of that. I, I am aware of that, yes, ma'am. And it meets those requirements. Well, it, it, it does. What I'm, uh, I, I think I'm answering a different question is with future uh, capabilities that we may have, I think we would have to ass assess that. Uh, but based on the, the previous, yes, I know that, that Fort Drum was, was the primary location. Great. And you understand if and when Congress establishes a requirement for, the, for a third Homeland Missile Defense Site on the East Coast, you understand that it's the DOD's responsibility to execute that requirement? I would be the strongest advocate to execute that uh, requirement if the if the threat required it. Yes, ma'am. And then shifting gears here, upstate New York, in addition to being home to Fort Drum in my di district, we also are home to another key Arctic unit, uh, the New York Air National Guard 109th Airlift Wing. And the 109th Airlift Wing operates the LC-130Hs, or known as the Ski Birds. These planes, as you know, are the only platform in the world that can provide critical logistical support in and around the Arctic, yet they are at the very end of their operational capability. Do you believe that the LC-130s have enabled the U.S. to maintain a strategic presence and lead in the Arctic? Uh, Congresswoman, yes, without a doubt. In fact, just this past week, they were in our AOR up uh, at uh, Arctic Edge and, and uh, Ice Camp operation uh, performing that unique capability. We believe, and this is a bipartisan issue for members of the New York delegation, I just authored a letter with my colleague Paul Tonko, so bipartisan support, about the urgent need for their recapitalization. So I would refer you to that. We'll make sure your office has a copy of that, but that's very important to maintain our leadership strategically in the Arctic region. Yield back. Thank you, Representative Norcross. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, General Cotton. Uh, we recently heard that the Sentinel program, or heard it, triggered the Nunn McCurdy Act, indicating there were serious concerns of cost overrun. And getting less into the actual dollars and cents and time delay, uh, we're about to uh, approve, hopefully approve, a budget and some money that's going to go into the fund the Department of Defense. Uh, and we are facing increasing pressures to fund all our programs. Uh, we have had the three legs of the triad incredibly important. If the Sentinel program continues and in the projections where it is going, it could come to the point that it almost becomes unaffordable in the way that it's laid out. At what point do we look at that program and say, do we go back to the drawing board, not so much to recapitalize our existing Minuteman 3s, but the requirements? Look at a different way of that third leg of the triad. Can you comment on that? Representative Norcross, thanks for the question. We have. So, um, you know, it, it, in regards to three administrations uh, doing an assessment in regards of do we keep a triad or do we go to something different, um, all said uh, we must maintain a triad. Um, and I'm not suggesting that, but within one of the legs, do we look at it differently, not just replicate and update with the existing ones, but look at a different configuration? Well, I don't know about a, a different configuration, and, 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 and I guess I don't know what you what you uh, mean by a different Probably not a good idea in open session, but yeah. the idea of just modernizing what we have to make it more acceptable to obviously t father time. But well, I can't like answer from this perspective, um, uh, Congressman, as far as the requirements that, that we lay, and that's, that's my responsibility sure. as STRATCOM, 
Um, and then the provider of that capability has come back to say that we can know, we can only meet that requirement at a certain amount of time in which that, that needs to then be replaced by a more modernized system. So if that answers your question, and that's, that's when I think we still must maintain an ICBM leg of some, of some semblance that probably looks a little different than a Minuteman 3. So the cost factor, there's no price that we can put on it. We'll pay whatever it takes to get it in. Well, I, I would hope, you know, that, that the uh, Air Force and everyone will be able to take a look at that and, and be able to come, come, come to some conclusion on how you, can, how you can make that. But the requirement for, for the land-based ICBM has not changed from, from my perspective. There's no question about that. So, Dr. Plum, this is, I want to throw it into your lane. Is it time that we look at that leg of how it is currently required and what we might do differently to bring in those cost issues? I'm not suggesting we do away with it, but do we look at it differently? So we all have to be careful here because we're now in a non mccurdy breach situation, sir, but my understanding is that one of the requirements for the Congress, and this is uh, under Secretary LaPlante's purview in ANS specifically and, and not ours, uh, is to relook the requirement and look at other ways that it could be possible to do it as all requirement of the Nimmercurdy breach through the congressional statute. All right, then let me switch things over to an easy one. Let, let's talk about um, the electromagnetic spectrum, something easy and non-controversial. <laughs> uh, obviously, this is rears its ugly head quite often. Uh, we recently went through uh, what the Department of Defense uh, wants to keep versus what the cellular carriers would like to obtain. Uh, it's not going to get any better soon. What is your assessment, not of where we just came from, but where we're going to be in five years with technology, not only from what the cellular carriers might need for our private side, but what we might need as a spectrum, I mean, whether it's 3.45 gigahertz. I mean, it keeps expanding in different ways that we can get into the spectrum. Can you give us an assessment of where we are with that well, in five minutes or less? Yes, sir. So I actually just had the pleasure of getting down to uh, Eglin Air Force Base and seeing some of our electronic warfare squadrons in the Air Force. Uh, and uh, I'll just say uh, the value of spectrum to the war fight and the ability to operate in these bands that we have carved out for ourselves is only going to grow in importance. And in particular, as we focus uh, on China as our pacing threat, where they have been aware of this for a long time, we have to maintain what we have to be able to compete. Uh, EW in the Ukraine-Russia conflict is providing lessons for everyone. It's being used every single day. Uh, we have to be ready for that. We have to be ready to fight our you know, near peer adversaries, not places where we just have superiority. My apologies, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Bacon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here. It's been a treat for me to work with many of you on the, uh, on the dais out here. Uh, got to talk to General Guillaume about a week ago, so I threw some questions at you then. So I'm going to focus a little more on the STRATCOM and space uh, side. First of all, it's very, I believe it's imperative that we have 400 ICBMs. We, we can't extend it any longer. Uh, so it's real imperative that the Air Force get this right and uh, learn from the mistakes and, and, and get these 400 missiles uh, installed. Uh, this committee is committed overwhelmingly to have three legs of the triad and do the modernization. The one area that we sometimes think thinks doesn't get the attention it deserves is the nuclear command and control. And in particular, from my vantage point, the survivability uh, part of that. So Joe Cotton, can you share with us the current status of STRATCOM's NC3 modernization efforts and your roadmap? Congressman Bacon, thanks for the question. <clears throat> I'm actually quite proud of what the team has done in the last 15 months in regards to um, create a roadmap uh, for NC3. Um, I think when I talked to this committee last year, one of my go-dos was to ensure that we could articulate the, the requirements from a near-term, mid-term, and long-term perspective. Um, we were able to do that. Um, it actually culminated with a uh, deputies, uh, the, the DSD department, uh, deputy secretary of defense uh, meeting, um, which turned into yet a go do for uh, for the service components on what we need to fight tonight, what we need for the midterm um, activities and modernization of NZ3, and then what will it take for the, the out years. 
Um, we're in the middle of a trade study right now uh, to find the, the best fit for, to be frank, the midterm. Um, zero to five year because we're already funded and thank you um, for being able to fund us for getting the near term and fight tonight activities done. Um, so as we prosecute that roadmap, um, it'll it'll be able to show us uh, gaps and seams um, that could potentially be seen um, between zero five and five and ten moving forward. So we're quite proud of the work that's being done there. Thank you. Uh, one of the survivable aspects for the nuclear C3 is the E6B Mercury mission, uh, where we have an airborne commands, command post, we put a flag officer on board that can take over if STRATCOM has hit the White House and the Pentagon. So as you know, the E6B is approaching retirement, and this timeline may accelerate once the Navy has confidence that its program schedule to transition an attack mode mission to the C-130J. So are you confident that the Air Force has a solution or a program to replace the airborne command post and looking glass missions? which today fly on the E6B? So part of that trade space study actually looks at that because that is a gap. Um, and, the, and the requirement is that the E6B will fly through the 2036 timeframe. So as you have mentioned, um, the Takamo um, um, acquire, um, acquisition is already underway in the Department of the Navy. Um, so as that trade space study comes to closure, it will identify that gap. And at that point in time, we'll need to find um, you know, what is going to be the replacement um, for the back end of that airplane, as you mentioned. And it's imperative this, that we have this mission. It, it gives second launch capability for our ICBM yes. force. And so this is very important, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we follow the Air Force on this because we've got to have this mission. We don't have a plan for it yet, and we're going to have to work this, work this part hard. Uh, General Whiting, uh, when I came in the Congress, I tried to put a lot of attention on the electronic mag magnetic spectrum operations. As an old guy, I called it just EW. Um, but we, we felt like we had a lot of work to do there. And I know STRATCOM has picked up the, the leadership on it, but I know you were telling me how important EW is to the space mission. So could you talk a little bit about your role in the EW realm? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Uh, you know, our satellites on orbit, the only way they can get their information down to planet Earth is through the EW spectrum. So it's absolutely vital to all that we do, and we appreciate the leadership role that uh, uh, the Congress has taken, and, and now uh, by, by uh, U.S. STRATCOM having the military responsibility for that. We have stood up a uh, an EM, joint EM office inside of uh, U.S. Space Command that is already very busy, and it's, it's only about seven months old, uh, that is making sure as we see um, uh, EMI in the environment, jamming in the environment, how are we assessing that, how are we operating through that, and um, it's, it's just foundational to all that we do, Congressman. Thank you very much. And I'll put a question in the record asking about the importance of the future roles for the B-52 and why it's so vital to the strategic mission. But I'm out of time, so I'll put it in for the record. Thank you. I, I yield. Thank you, Representative Garamendi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Plum, you spoke in response to uh, Mr. Norcross about the uh, nunn mccurdy requirement. Uh, you went through it very quickly. There are five specific elements of the law that must be answered. Are you and the Air Force prepared to answer all five fully, completely, and honestly? Uh, Congressman, so just to be clear, I don't have any Nunn McCurdy statutory authority myself. That is an ANS thing, but yes, of course, the department will be answering them fully and honestly and correctly. General Cotton, same question. Uh, the answer is yes. Very good. I think that takes care of it. Um, well, I expect that, and we would expect nothing less here. Uh, if we were to define strategy in the military terms, we would probably say it's uh, aligning unlimited aspirations with limited amount of money. Unless somebody has found some way to uh, continue to increase by perhaps 10 percent or 15 percent a year the Department of Defense budget, strategy means making choices by the military as well as by us. General Cotton, you spoke earlier about the need for the ICBM. Uh, you said it's, a re it's required. Can you tell me in specificity 
what can not what can not be done by the other two legs of the triad that only the ICBM can do? Congressman Garamendi, I can. The ICBM provides a responsive, the ICBM provides a, a responsiveness to the President of the United States that no other two legs can provide. Really? That is correct. The, the bomber force and the submarine force is not responsive? They are responsive, but not as responsive and quickly um, um, can it provide a response as quick as the ICBM so, if it was warranted by the president, if I was to present, op, present what would options. Create, what would create a response? Well, I, I would rather not talk in Well, let's in say the that there's a there. warning coming from uh, Mr. General Whitting that there are incoming missiles. What's the responsive? Well, it would, it would be obvi obviously up to the President of the United States on does he want to... Well, and how many minutes does he have to respond? I, I will not say that here in, open, in well, an open hearing. In the public domain, it's 15 minutes. You don't need to respond, but uh, I don't know anybody's going to be disagreeing with that. Is that the, nation of, is that the definition of responsive? 15 minutes to make a decision about the launch of those weapons. Now, let's assume they were launched. Would it make any difference if it was 15 minutes or 30, 40 minutes that a submarine? Well, you're making the assumption, uh, Congressman, that the, that the difference between the other two legs is yet another 15 or 20 minutes. And I can get in more detail if we were in a closed environment to tell you what that difference would really so be. So they're, they're less responsive. Survivable leg is the sea leg. Flexible leg is the air leg. Responsive leg is the ICBM leg. In other words, immediate launch or lose it. It's the user to lose it, isn't it? That's it's, it's not the effect of the launch. The launch would be the same if it were launched from a submarine or from an airplane. Uh, that's not quite correct, uh, uh, Congressman, because I can hold I can hold different elements at risk with a with the different different legs of the triad. We should go into that in detail, General Whitting. What is your uh, um, need for programs that are not in your current budget? Uh, Congressman, Isn't it about one point three billion dollars. Uh, Congressman, I, I just uh, have signed our unfunded priority list, and it, that total is about $1.2 billion. Could you use any part of the $6 billion that's currently authorized for the continued progress of the Sentinel, even though it is now none McCurdied? Would you like about maybe a fifth of that? Congressman, about $6 billion we're going to spend on the Sentinel this year. Yeah. Congressman, I don't identify the sources of the funds, just I know what my requirements are to fulfill well, my, our mission. My point here is to my colleagues. We do identify the source, and we do have the responsibility of aligning strategy with limited money. Thank you. I yield back. Okay, that concludes the questioning portion of our hearing today. Uh, let me just add a slight clarification from my perspective. You threw out a number uh, a minute ago, Representative Garmendi. There are different numbers that are floating around out there, and I don't think it would be wise for any of us to confirm or deny any specific number because I think that that's really not, not a topic of discussion we should be having in an open session like this. Which leads me to my next point. We will um, go into recess and immediately reconvene upstairs and have perhaps a brief classified hearing because votes will be called shortly, but uh, we will have a classified hearing for those who are able to attend, and thank you for your testimony today. We are in recess. <laughs>